Welcome everybody to the Hustle Culture Podcast, where we profile entrepreneurs who are climbing their way to the top as well as making a difference. Welcome to the show. Today, my co-host is Carlos Gill, and we have the lovely chef Lizette as our guest. Hey, hey, welcome, Hustle Culture Nation. This is your co-host, Carlos Skill. I'm really excited about this episode because we have the lovely Chef Lisette joining us. And before I bring her on and welcome her to the show, I just want to go through Chef Lisette's bio. And this is just straight on her LinkedIn. Chef Lisette has been celebrating 24 years of feeding more than Four and a half million people, which include five U.S. presidents, world leaders, dignitaries, royalty, Fortune 500 executives, celebrities, and people from all walks of life. She has an amazing background. We're looking forward to getting to know her a little bit more over the next uh, hour or so. So with that, welcome to Hustle Culture, Chef Lisette. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here with you. You know, yeah, we're <laughs> really excited to have you as well. Thank you, thank you. You know, when Carlos was, was saying your your bio, one of the first things I was I was saying is, how did you meet those people? So, give a given uh, give the audience a chance to get inside your head and understand what exactly it was for you uh, to actually decide to be a chef. You know, it really came. So, I'm uh, Mexican American. I was born in Mexico City. We moved back to the United States. I'm the youngest of three. So we moved back to the United States when I was about five or six. And so after that, every single Sunday was about getting together at my grandparents' house with about 20 of us that would just pack in the house every Sunday. And that really absolutely planted the seed of the definition of what food means in my life and what I now teach and hopefully inspire folks to see what's possible in their life. And that is that food is an absolute celebration. It is the centerpiece of every home. And the kitchen is really the heartbeat of every home. And so when you bring your family and your friends together, it, it just elevates your life to a whole nother level. And so when I was in high school thinking about, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Um, it's just really interesting because back in the day, I mean, <laughs> I feel old just even saying back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> but I got to tell you, I mean, because I've been doing this 24 years. So you could just, you know, flash back 24 years. And, you know, I was surrounded by people like my sister who knew she wanted to be a lawyer her whole life. I was surrounded by people who knew what they wanted to do at a very young age. I was not one of them. So I did many other things. I went into fashion school. I wanted to be a buyer for, you know, the fashion industry. Um, but, you know, when I, in retrospect, when I look back, every single position that excited me, like being a nurse, being a real estate broker, it was all going back to just serving people. And so it makes perfect sense that I decided to be a chef. Uh, because at the end of the day, I'm serving people. And it's it's been a thrill. It continues to be a thrill after 24 years. It blows my mind how every single day actually gets more exciting. I, I get excited just hearing about food and cooking, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm a big foodie myself. Let's get right into it. What are some of your favorite dishes that you like to cook? Um, or, or tell us about a time in which you had the, the honor of serving, whether it was a U.S. president or a, a Fortune 500 executive. Tell us what type of food they like to eat. You know, it's so funny. I swear to you, the millionaires and billionaires of the planet, because I haven't just served those in this country, are really just the most simple either really health conscious or meat and potatoes. I mean, I cannot mention the person's name because unfortunately, like many of the people who I've cooked for, I still have confidentiality agreements. Um, but I'll tell you, this, is, this person is a tower of industry. You see their name brand, their family brand all over the world, not just in the United States. And so like the first thing that I made him was a BLT and you know, I tried to like, okay, how can I make this BLT really fancy? But he just wanted it really simple. And it was a complete honor. I actually took a picture of, 
you know, my presentation of that BLT because, I mean, that photograph is timeless and and later on as I can divulge over the years who that person is it'll make sense to you how memorable um but it was a, it was a BLT sandwich you know I've had presidents who really just want a really great burger um you know celebrities I mean I got to tell you that folks who are more in Hollywood driven are really health conscious and so I mean, I've really done everything across the gamut from amazing Mexican food to Italian food, French food, Mediterranean food, um, to just really classic American food. And, and of course, the hallmark being tweaking every one of those genres to be healthier because everyone who does hire me does want a healthier component to all of the different cuisines that I just mentioned. That's re it's really interesting, and I, I like what you're saying is that, you know, we always think these celebrities are larger in life, but at the end of the day, just regular people, they just want BLTs like we do as well, so it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. But, Chef, I want, to, I want to go back to a point you made earlier. You said, unlike your sister, you didn't know, you didn't quite know what you wanted to be, so you did many, many, many things. Many hustlers out there, many people that listen to the show and podcast certainly identify with that. I, I know I do myself. What do you say to those people who are still trying to find out what their why is, right? You know, what their purpose is and what they're good at. And how can you, what, I mean, what piece of advice can you tell them? You know, it's actually really, really simple. Um, it's simple and it's not because the way you get to that journey is by doing a bunch of stuff that you don't like doing. I mean, I know that that's a cliche that many successful people will tell you, but it absolutely is the key to success because you have no reference point. You know what I mean? I mean, so many people come out of college or now many millennials are thinking, I don't want to go to college, but what am I going to do with the rest of my life? The moment you look at your life from a macro perspective, from a very large picture, it gets really frustrating and complicated. So I always recommend to people of all ages to go down to the micro, the micro moments of your life, the micro jobs. Um, I mean, because if, you, if you've had any kind of job experience, even if it's working at a fast food restaurant, there's something there that you did that you either liked or did not like. And maybe it speaks to your people skills. Maybe it speaks to your public relations skills. Or if you dealt with money, your financial skills. Um, and so, like I said, even though my intention was to go into the fashion world right after high school, and then I did many other things, many jobs that I hated. I mean, I got to tell you, the job that was the most frustrating, and it's almost like a fun story to tell now, is I actually handled accounts receivables at a cemetery and it was it it was the most horrifying thing anytime I had to call you know Mrs. Jones let's say and say you're late on your husband's payment you know because it's such an emotional conversation calling from such and such cemetery because then that brings up memories of their dead spouse or dead loved one and I'm calling about money they're late on the payment, you know what I mean? And it was just horrifying. But what I learned from that job, what I learned about myself was the compassion, the level of care that I took in those calls, because it wasn't just about, I mean, there's many people who could have just made it like a manufactured call, like, you're late, this is how much it is, when, when are we going to get it, blah, blah, blah. But I really started to get to know myself in those kinds of jobs, because I am at the end of the day, just a people-driven human being. And so even in that job that I hated, it gave me a sign that I have huge compassion and I know how to navigate conversations with people. So my tip to youngsters or people who are trying to go through career changes is look at your DNA. Because the moment you start even stepping outside and looking at your family and all of that, it's just, it's too confusing, it's too frustrating. You have to really get self-aware, know yourself, look in the mirror, and go way back. Like when you were five years old, what did you like to do when you were playing? How did you play? Who did you hang out with? Like you really have to go back 
and that's why I said mic on a micro level and dissect and take inventory of every part of your life because it will give you clues. It will absolutely give you clues of the person that you're supposed to be as an adult. Yeah, that's really good advice, uh, Chef. So, you know, one of the things that we like to do here on the Hustle Culture Podcast is is really get deep down into into the hustle behind the entrepreneur. So we recognize that the climb is not always overnight, okay? It takes many years to go ahead and build up this great resume that you have. But let's talk about let's talk about that climb. Tell us a little bit about the struggles that you've had to face to get to where you're at today. Well, I just find it, I mean, it's really humbling to even be at this point to have people who want to interview me, to have more public exposure and all of that. I mean, I almost kind of giggle internally because everything about my journey has been difficult. And what I mean by that is I'm a Mexican-American woman. And I'll tell you what that means. The chef world is still to this day very, very male dominated, very male ego dominated. Um, and so just navigating through the kitchens of the United States with that of, you know, having to deal with very strong male, male egos. I mean, my first job out of culinary school was at the Ritz Carlton in Marina del Rey. I was very, very, um, grateful to get that job, but it also speaks to my communication skills and how I present myself because I had already been in corporate America, so I came in very polished, and even though I had zero experience as a chef, just with culinary schooling, I got that job, and so I became a sponge and just wanted to take it all in, but I got to tell you, back in the day when I worked at the Ritz-Carlton, there were more than 60 chefs, sous chefs, garmage in every department you could imagine in the structure of a kitchen. And more than 60 of those chefs, there were only two females, and I was one of them. Now when you go into Kitchens of America, you see you know, a much bigger variety of all races, more women. But you know, back in the day, it was predominantly white males. There were maybe two African Americans. I was the Hispanic, you know, and the only Hispanics always were just washing the dishes. And so, you know, when I got into the private sector of going into people's homes, multi-million dollar homes, you know, the clients would reference me and treat me as though I was part of the housekeeping staff. Why? Because I looked like them. Literally, there were Hispanic, I'm Hispanic. So even though, let's say, two chefs would walk in at the same time because it was a large party, the male chef, regardless of what race he was, was still regarded with higher accolades because he was a man and I was a woman who looked more like the housekeeping staff. And so I dealt with sexism, racism, every kind of ism you can imagine my entire career still to this day still i mean it still hasn't changed no and how I, do you fight go i'm sorry go ahead tayo no i i love that you're saying that because it's it's a lot of what we do you know carlos is latino american i'm a nigerian that, that you know there's growing up in several countries and i'm a nigerian here who's perceived as an african american so there's certain cultural nuances that go with being a hustler and entrepreneur how do you turn those um, you know, perceived challenges, even though they're not, into advantages for yourself. And uh, I like to say, how do you use your difference to make a difference? But how do you turn the fact that you're a Latino American and you're a woman and say, and go up to a corporate American and say, you know what, this is why I, I have value and this is why you need to have me in your kitchen? Well, what's interesting is now being a business owner, I mean, let's just deal with the numbers, right? There's even less women in entrepreneurship. So now <laughs> I went from the climb of navigating my way through male-dominated kitchens now into entrepreneurship that even is more inundated with men. But because I already have 24 years of experience, I can tell you the absolute hallmark to getting noticed and it not even being 
like it being irrelevant whether I'm a female, whether I'm Mexican American, is excellence. When you bring your A game, when you have experience, when you do the work to be excellent at what you do, then that's what gets noticed. Talent and skill eventually just fades away all the isms that we have to deal with in the world. So, Chef, as we continue to talk through your climb here in the Hustle Culture Podcast, talk us through how, how have you been able to fight through adversity in terms of you know, gender adversity that you had mentioned before, you know, racial, you know, I, I can relate as well being Hispanic American, you know, I grew up in the United States. I was born in Florida. My parents came from Cuba, but I've lived in Montana. I've lived in Utah. I've found myself in situations throughout my career where even though I speak English just as good as the next person, because my name is Carlos and my skin tone is a little darker than someone else. I haven't always been treated as fairly. So I'm really curious to know from you, what have you done to persevere and push through that? You just have to dig deep. I mean, you just have to dig deep. And here's the other thing. Because I consider myself to be a student of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and all of the trials and tribulations and sacrifices that that generation made, really for it to even be possible for me to want to be an entrepreneur and you know what I mean we 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 have come so far there's so much more road and and territory that we need to break through but I mean like in my hardest moments in my toughest days of dealing with racism or or that kind of ignorance because that's what it is I I literally like channel what Someone like a Martin Luther King, like a Malcolm X, like a Medgar Evers, and all of the men and women who sacrificed in that time, what was their day like? Because their day was a hell of a lot worse than mine. You know what I mean? Like, what did they go through on an average day to try? I mean, just imagine how enormous that is, that every day these were people around the world, not just here in this country, who were trying to be the pioneers for equality, for men, for women, for all races. I mean, just imagine what they went through in a day dealing with dogs, you know, being chased by dogs and police and, you know, gas bombings. And I mean, you just have to look at the history of this country or of the world and know that my bad day at work, even though it seems horrible, cannot compare to what you know, the real pioneers who have made equality possible for you and I, what they went through. So when I have had a difficult day, and it still continues, um, I just really channel, and I'm grateful, I'm really, really grateful that my bad day cannot even compare to what someone else has gone through. No, I love it. I love it. And there's this quote, um, just to channel it back to, to early conversations, this quote that I love, it says, people lose their way when they lose their why. I, and I think that's something that people have Completely. to. Completely. Yeah, I think that's something that people have to remember even during the hard times. So even if it's going through those, uh, you know, challenges that you may have, it's you. If you remember why you started the business, um, and why you do what you do, you know, your your compass is definitely head, taking you to the right direction. But you have a unique business. But I want you to explain what's unique about your business to others, and that might not know about it. You know, because you're a chef, and there are many chefs in the world, but. I think there's something unique about what you do and the way you connect with others. And I think a lot of people listening out there would get the value out of that. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really, um, setting the intention that even though, even though I've been a chef and event producer and server of the public, you could say for 24 years, this is really the new chapter of where I take it to, a completely different level and what that means by that is you know chef Lizette which is my name as well is going to is a wellness brand and so I do speaking engagements I do cooking demonstrations to corporations organizations universities to speak to the emotional component that it's a conversation that just is not having around food so you could say that I'm moving into the food educator piece which means that 
it is my absolute why, as you mentioned, why I wake up in the morning is to show folks that there is value way beyond just putting a plate in front of yourself because it's about how you cater to yourself. And so the conversation that that I'm setting, which is really new territory, if you want to say in the chef world, is I look at the psychological, emotional component of food and how it is absolutely the very best teacher in your life. And if you allow it to, it can inform every single decision you make as an entrepreneur, as a husband, as a wife, as a friend, because it boils down to this. It's not just about the food that you put on your plate. It's not that it has to be all healthy and that's not what I'm teaching. I'm teaching the care, the love, the time, the attention that you put to catering to yourself and the ones that you love is an absolute reflection of how you give back to yourself and more importantly to the world. And so I'm making that connection one conversation at a time, one speaking engagement at a time, one podcast at a time, one interview at a time, hoping that people will be interested in this new way of thinking that food is not just sustenance, it's not just the nutrition that you need to put in your body, but it is absolutely the best teacher in your life if you allow it to be. Excellent. That's real talk, Chef. So let's uh, shift gears into marketing and how you help get the word out there for the Chef Lisette brand. So um, I met you through Meerkat earlier this year. We have connected now across a lot of the social networks out there. We tweet back and forth. I see your your cooking on Snapchat. We've hung out on Blab. What impact has social media made on your career? Um, and talk to us a little bit about how you use it. It's well, I mean, we'd have to go back for a quick second, and I'll do it really quickly, which is like the DNA why I knew in retrospect going back, why I knew I was always destined to be an entrepreneur, because I was always interested in nonfiction books about business ever since my, you know, high school years. And so the first book that I read was from Lee Iacocca, who was the president of Chrysler. Uh, hardcore, I mean, highly revered. I highly recommend that everyone look him up. I don't know how many people know about him, but he was a tower of industry for, for the car industry. And so from after Lee Iacocca was Dale Carnegie, was, you know, all of the classic books that you see out there to Anthony Robbins to, I mean, just, and Anthony Robbins is more lifestyle, you know, he, he helps you elevate your life. But in terms of like the hardcore business books, I was just fascinated in consuming them. And so I found Gary Vaynerchuk in 2007, which is, how we really connected through the Vayner Nation and through his amazingly large and wonderful community. So I started following him uh, really early in his earliest days of Wine Library TV and was just immediately drawn by his charismatic personality. I think that <laughs> I like I like to say that I that speaks to me because I think that's who I am. And so it was just fascinating to me actually also how organic and how confident he was in putting together a show on YouTube where it was not, you could say, Hollywood quality. It was more homegrown, and I really loved that authentic feel to the show. And so then he wrote uh, Crush It, and then Thank You Economy, and I mean, I've been following his work ever since and learning from him. And he was the absolute centerpiece of my learning when it came to social media and how I can shift gears from what I used to do, which is be in the public eye at an event, cooking in someone's private home, to now reaching a larger audience through social media and having people literally from all over the world now paying attention to what I'm doing. And it was Gary 100% who, who really was the catalyst to all of that. It's amazing. Have you ever met uh, Gary? I have. Yes, I have. have. So that must have been a good yeah, I've got two Vayner, Vayner Nation people here on this podcast because I know Carlos is a yeah. big fan as well. 
Oh, that's I, the- I am a huge Gary fan. I have not had the good fortune of meeting him yet, though, in person. Well, see? Well, when you, when you do, you will remember it forever. <laughs> I'm sure I will. <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt my, myself. So, Carlos Vaynerchuk, influencer. You, influencer. Many people who are coming into the social media industry and trying to figure out how to use social media to get the business to the next level are starting to realize that they need to get in front of the right people. And something that you've done a good job of is making sure your content is seen in front of the right uh, right influencer, right person in the industry. What kind of tips mm-hmm. can you offer people out there who are you know in their own industry and trying to say, get in, in, in front of the right person? Well, um... I mean, we we all had a conversation prior to this, so I should just maybe get us up to speed to why you're asking that question. Julia Child, the Julia Child, ended up being my mentor early on in my culinary career. And ever since her, I've been able to garner the attention of hot, we're talking about legendary influencers. I mean, it's so funny how that word influencers is now like a new buzzword but quite honestly i you know some of my mentors are some of the change agents of the world i mean many of them who i cannot mention because you know that's the kind of relationship we have and i respect that and so there's many things that i to talk about here because i think that people are confused when it comes to influencers and how to navigate that world uh, which I said in our previous conversation is you have to be really selective about who you're listening to, who you're consuming. Are they worthy of your time? You know, and I don't care if it's literally a world leader. You have to really spend time digging deep into their work, into their psychology of who they are, their DNA. Are they a good human being? You know, or have they just manufactured an amazing career and made a marketing machine out of amazing status? I mean, because there's many celebrities and many influencers who know how to do that well. So I tell people, once you've taken the time to really do your homework on who you want to be an influencer in, in your life, which is really, forget about influencer, I like to use your teacher, your mentor, You know, and maybe with time they might be your friend, but you have to set the intention that in order to get their attention, and I don't care if it's Steven Spielberg, Oprah Winfrey, President Obama, all are available if you believe you have the potential of garnering attention from someone like that. And the way you do that is to not put anyone on a pedestal. To see them all that, guess what? We're all human beings. We all in our pants the same way. We all <laughs> eat. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to realize that even Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, the Pope, we're still all beings on this planet. You know what I mean? And so Julia Child wasn't always Julia Child. And the moment that I just started to really chase after her and go to her book signings, go to her speaking engagements, to wine tasting dinners, and just followed her around, I wasn't nervous anymore. And this was early on. This was way before I had exposure to Hollywood. Um, you know, once I finally met her and she was a grand presence just to begin with, she was way taller than me. So she was literally a towering figure. But she was also just the most kind and humble and honest human being you could want to be around. And so I highly recommend, Carlos, since you haven't met Gary or whoever you want or you consider your influencers and mentors to be, is when you do have that magic moment is, I mean, of course, to praise and compliment them because they've had impact in your life. But... There should be no one that is on a pedestal. You know what I mean? You should be your, on your own pedestal. And so when you approach people on that high level, uh, as though you're both fools, they really respect that. Or it definitely like throws them off. You know, not that you're being condescending or egoic or, you know what I mean? 
there's a level of humility that you have to approach those people. But when you're like, hey, I'm pretty spectacular too. You know what I mean? So yeah, absolutely. You may want to be my friend. Maybe <laughs> it's not just the other way around. You right. Know, one one of my mentors. You know, I believe in. I, I definitely believe in having mentors. And you know, we'll talk. We'll still talk about influencers here in a minute because I definitely want to hear what both of you um, think about what I'm going to say. But one of my mentors is a C-level executive. He's a CEO for a um, for a known company. And a couple of years ago, I was having dinner with him, and I was just I was really timid at that point in my career. And I was always timid, not when it came to approaching my own peers, but when it came to approaching senior level executives. And I would just tense up. I would freeze. I wouldn't know what to say. I would obviously be very nervous. And his advice to me is one of the best advices that I have received, p- perhaps in my life and I know in my career. And that's just be yourself. Mm-hmm. And to that point, it was anytime you're around anyone, regardless of how much money they make or what their status or, or position is in life, they put on their pants the same way that you do, which you had just said, chef. And right. it was just really just be yourself. And, you know, I've had the, the opportunity to meet some really cool people throughout my career and you know, hang out with some big names. And again, when, it, when we talk about Gary, and just the impact that he's made on my life, it goes beyond influencer status. I wouldn't be right. sitting here talking to either of you right now if it wasn't for back in 2009 and 2010 when I was struggling just to get by financially, learning about Gary and really following him. And really just being inspired. And when I look at Gary, I see a guy of, you know, I, I see someone who's accomplished a whole heck of a lot, but honestly, there's nothing stopping me or you or Tayo from from owning our own success. And Absolutely. the day I meet Gary, honestly, I just want to shake his hand and say thank you. Uh, more right. than anything. It's just say thank you for for him being himself. Right. And uh, you know, on that note, you know, going back to influencers, I think the, the term influencer is misused nowadays and it's really abused and I say that because you have this younger generation that's up and coming and they ask me you know how do you become an influencer and I let them know I have no idea you know I've never <laughs> aspired to be an influencer I can tell well, you I'm still be- confused like what's the difference between a mentor and an influencer well, I don't know well, I, I, I can tell you there's various degrees you know my mom and dad they're influencers for me uh, mm-hmm. someone like Gary Vaynerchuk who's not only walks the walk, but he talks it. That he's an influencer. You know, someone that I view that has been successful in their business or in their career. Mm-hmm. Uh, I view that as having influence. But honestly, guys, and Tayo, I want to hear your perspective on this. Mm-hmm. Just having a lot of followers on Twitter. I'm sorry, guys, but that does not make you an influencer. No, I think what the, the term influencer has come to almost be synonymous with like thought leader. So it's if you have that power to you know say something and and it impacts a, a whole industry or a, a consumer spending pattern if you if, if someone hears your voice say you should go buy that or you should invest in this platform like um scoble robert scoble for example um those type of people i think that to me is what i see as an influencer like a gary vaynerchuk mm-hmm. can say something about social media and be like that's okay that's what he said and you know people will not question uh his type of thing but that's the way i see it uh I think mentor is a little different in the sense that it, you know those are those are you know they stay with you and they're they're almost more personal in that type of way. But it could be wrong. I think we all have different definitions of that. But that's my term, my view of what an influencer is. Okay, that that totally makes sense to me now. So you're saying that a mentor is more with you in the trenches, helping you out, mm-hmm. replying to an email, right. or you can talk to them on the phone, invest in the like time. That. Yeah, invest in the time in you to see you develop into the person, you know, the mentor-mentee yeah. relationship. And um, yeah, so I mean, I do think it's totally overused. You have all these people saying, I think with the YouTube um, generation, that's almost accelerated this influencer thing, because now you have many people mm-hmm. with their own channels, and you go to, New- I live in New York City, so you see many people with um, YouTube.com slash something, and they have like... 20 million subscribers and like oh my goodness he must be an influencer so all these brands need to work with him because if he, if he can say this to his followers or her followers then we're going to get all these sales and we'll target his demographic and that's going to be the amazing for our business because someone else is using it so i think it becomes that type of thing and calls hit the point when you said younger generation i'm in that gen demographic so i shouldn't be saying it like that but we, <laughs> we, we tend to we tend to sometimes want quick success and 
and we get romanticized that we, you know, by seeing all these people who are on TV and have, have amassed all these followers, but uh, calls with tested this, having a lot of followers is different from actually connecting with them. So it's that type of thing. It's just a vanity metric. And I think a lot of people get, get really pulled into just those numbers. Yeah. And uh, they, they really don't think through, you got to hustle. <laughs> I know Absolutely. the name of our show is Hustle Culture. You got to hustle. There is no overnight success. The climb is going to be a slow climb, and you have to be willing to put in the sweat equity. And if you're not going to put in the sweat equity, then get out of line because there's someone else coming right behind you who's willing to do so. Yeah, and, and you invest in the time. Look, invest, you, if you're going to build an audience, and if you want someone to listen to you for something that you feel like you're an expert in, you have to also see it like these people are investing time with me. I should invest time in them. Because uh, I, I know Carlos, for example, and, and you, I think you do a chef. I've seen some of your interviews, chef. Where you you provide them value, and sometimes you you know you listen to what they say. What do you want? You know that's why I love Blab. What do you want to hear? What do you want to do? You give them the chance to feel like they're going with you on the journey, and that's the way you can actually turn your quote unquote influencer status, if that's what you want to go with, to actually right. making that influence because you're using that followers. But if you're in it to just to get twenty million followers and not do anything with that, then it's just like Carlos said, it's vanity metrics because people will see through all that stuff, and no one's gonna. You know, think of you when you're tweeting out something if you're not giving them anything that they can use. So, well, here's the thing, guys. I mean, if I could do my little three, two minute rant here on go this. for it, rant, drop, um, it, like, drop go. it like it's hot, <laughs> go, <laughs> go, go, go. And I mean, listen, you're talking to a lady who's 44 years old, okay? I mean, I, I've been around the block a few times and I'm still young, you know what I mean? It's like. I'm so young in the game. I mean, people would laugh at me saying you're 44, you know? So you guys are like mini babies. <laughs> I'm um, the baby. Baby. Tyo's the baby. I'm, I'm the baby. I'm like the middle-aged social media <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm the baby here, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I mean, but he, he, the, I think we all need to understand and get really, really honest with business, okay? Okay. Uh, I mean, social media, as I had mentioned to you in our last amazing conversation, the reason why I love social media is because it introduced me to Carlos Gill and now Teo and now so many other players who we were in the conversation with because I am in the people connection business. Still to this day, I don't have one thing to sell to you guys. You know what I mean? Like the audience and friends and relationships that I'm building are not based on Okay, how can I throw a right hook? At one point, can I tell you to go to this link and buy this thing? My intention has been pure the whole way through and will continue to be that I am about building relationships. And why is that? Because I saw my grandfather who had his own business for 55 years and literally died a week. He worked a week within his passing. So you're talking about, you want to talk about hustler. You want to talk about entrepreneur. I mean, my grandfather to this day is my favorite entrepreneur. You know, imagine 55 years of building relationships with clients that built, I mean, oh my God, like the two weeks that we spent in calling his clients to tell him that he passed because many of them were with him 20, 30 years. I mean, they wept as though it was a family member, you know what I mean? And so, and then my mother who had her own business for 26 years, a commercial cleaning business that literally started with a hundred dollars, some cleaning supplies, a contract to go and clean brand new homes and, you know, ended up with a staff of 75 the entire Southern California territory of contracts of all the new homes, her company had it. Um, so you're talking about really building businesses. That's what we're talking about here is building businesses. And social media is a vehicle that can connect you to building relationships. And so the thing that I just have a hard time and I feel frustrated for you guys, quite honestly, because your generation, because there's live streaming and Facebook and all of these platforms, I think people get confused that 
these are just tools and vehicles to communicate with people. But now we're now we're speaking the language that my audience and what is my reach and what are my analytics and I mean, do you know what I mean? It's like my grandfather didn't have to deal with all of that. He was focused on building a business, which building a business means building relationships with your customers and your employees. I mean, you know what I mean? It's all centered based on people first. No, you're right. So, you know what I mean? And so I, I don't know. I just think that anyone who's listening to this, regard, I, I mean, I think that the older peeps who will be listening to this will get it because at the centerpiece of your social media goals, because I mean, let's have that conversation. It should still be driven with a compass that you're building genuine relationships. I know that Carlos and I, 15 years from now, will still be hustling and having conversation. You know what I mean? It's oh, like, it. that's all I care about is I just want, who's, you know, what crew am I building? You know, it's like, and my crew is just getting larger and larger. So I know that when I have a book or a speaking engagement, to invite people to it's just like turning a light switch it's like just on and off it's just automatic because my intention has been pure from the beginning of just building organic relationships and really understanding your dna so i know how to really provide you something that is worthy of your time you know what i mean and so i think that right now because this is kind of such a pioneering really new era of of business and how we work in the world i mean it, it's like a new industrialized revolution quite honestly and so it feels like a new gold rush like in that time where people just out and going for gold and you know everyone like just took off in their wagons and <laughs> tried to figure it out in their own way and it seems that that's what people are doing with social media and periscope and meerkat and blab and Everyone's trying to figure their, you know, figure the, their path and figure what they're doing with this. But I'm telling you, the people who focus on building relationships so that you can pull those cards, you can ask for help. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's about building a business and a business is based on people. And so when you c focus on that, then you will be t here 10 years down the road because like all these platforms are evolving. I mean, every single day you literally have new applications, new things to upload on your mobile phone. You know, I mean, there's technology is crazy how it's evolving. So what we see right now, I mean, Facebook, there might be a new version of a Facebook 10 years from now. So people like us who are fascinated and, and love the art of social media and are practitioners and doing the work, we we will always adjust and evolve with the new game, with the new platform. But it's not about that. It's about do you really understand what the real DNA is? And the real DNA, the heart and soul of all of this is for you to connect with human beings, period. Boom. Mic drop. All right. No. Boom. No, it's, no you're so right. And I think it's it, – and the people who have the conversations and you w use words like tactics and know your analytics and you know what I mean? Like they're coming from a more manufactured, like how can I spin this web so that I can get more viewers and have a million followers and get, you know, a hundred thousand views on my YouTube videos so I can get sponsors and you know what I mean? Like what if they're all of a sudden tomorrow becomes a new format of like all advertisers are gone. You know what I mean? Like now it's more about the quality is what's going to rise to the top. So the businesses who actually have amazing cars or an amazing graphic design business, like I could see the day where there's going to be a new way of how you monetize via social media, via the internet. And so that's when I say that it's going to always go back to quality. It's going to always go back to quality work that you're doing that will put you on top of the game. Yeah, Carlos, I mean, Carlos, you do this a lot where you talk to, you deal with social media brands and companies. But 
before I, before you, you go, I want I just wanted to say the point that you keep reiterating is business is based on people and people and how you, you relate to them, basically relationships, essentially, and how you right. connect to all these people. I think you're right in the sense that, you know, a lot of people have fallen the, with the idea that social media, it's all about, you know, this metrics that you have to have and analytics you have to have. But in that right. they and by doing that, they lose the essence of what social media should be, which is social. It's actually in the name social, right. uh, which should be about building relationships. But with our generation, I think if you, if you look and see the people that are successful, whether it's Michelle Fawn with YouTube or some of these other people on Vine and, and, and Instagram, it's it's the fact that they have whenever they go out somewhere, people, their friends know where to reach out to them. Like, hey, I'm in the city. Come do this. I want to hear all your, all your, all your thoughts, all that kind of things. So it's it, they've built that relationship. So I think more and more people in our generation are gradually getting to that point where they understand that the numbers don't do anything, but right. it's, it's what you do with that. Um, so I, I, I have hope. I mean, I'm being optimistic for, for my generation, obviously, but I think, I, I think a lot of us are getting to the point where we realize that we need to do a lot more in the relationship building aspect because we're not going to be successful. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's just, that's just what I want to add to that. But I don't know if Carl's going to Well, I have, I, I have, I'm sorry, I just want to say, I have tremendous optimism for your generation. You just need to keep going back to remembering, like we said at the beginning, what is your why and what are you offering? Like, what are you offering? You know what I mean? There's so many people talking on Blab right now and Meerkat and Periscope and they're not saying one thing. Do you know what I mean? There's not one ounce of substance there that is original, that is completely unique to them. There's so many people, and because there is a Gary Vaynerchuk, who there's only one Gary Vaynerchuk, so many people try to just do a carbon copy with their own little twist. But guess what? I've been following... Gary's work since 2007 I see a carbon copy 10 miles away you know what I mean and so people will always see that yeah so chef you bring up a really good point how can someone stand out and be their best self without copying Gary and, and I say that because I was at one point in my life say I would openly tell others out there I want to be the next Gary Vaynerchuk I want to be Gary Vaynerchuk when I grow up. And one day, I think this is when I, right around the time I turned 30, I woke up one day and said, you know what? Forget that. Right. I love him, but I just want to be Carlos Gill. And well, it's not a diss to him at all. No, no, you know? no, it's not. It's not at all. But now I have folks that come up to me and they say the same thing. They say, I want to be like this person. I want to be like that person. And I tell them, just be yourself. Be your original self. Right. Be the person that you were made to be and discover what your unique talents are and go out and just get it. Just you can Well that's why I mean that's why I go to back to the micro when I say explore in your life. Like I'll give you an example and I don't really talk about like my family members and my life, but I'm so I'm such a proud auntie. It drives me nuts. I mean, you know, like I need the t shirt. I've had the t shirt. My niece and nephew, uh both are at the Naval Academy. My niece already graduated from the Naval Academy. Keep in mind, my sister's Mexican. Their father is African-American. So my niece and nephew are combination Mexican, African-American. So just look at those numbers of just even trying to get in to the Naval Academy. The kind of grades, the kind of excellence you've needed your entire high school, junior high career to even get accepted, okay? Because the minority rate is micro still in many, many Ivy League premier schools, okay? But going back to my niece, who's now going to be a pilot, who now you're going to see at some point just rocking this planet, when I think back to, God, what was her DNA? This was a little girl, because she's still my little girl that I adore. She's a young woman now, but this was a little girl I remember taking apart you know, Legos and adored building Legos and building things and into science. And so that's what I'm saying is forget about like how you're going to present yourself in front of the public. You should dive deep into who are you? Like, who Mm -hmm. were you when you were a little kid? What did you like doing? Because there's real influence and clues 
to who you're going to become. Yeah, no, you're right. You, you know, so so she has an engineer and completely tech. Um, I mean, she's just, it, it's extraordinary with intelligence and all, like, literally, like, security intelligence and all these right. different um, opportunities that she's, that she now has available. But it all came from a really curious little girl who liked building and taking things apart and understanding the analytics or, you know, the analysis that goes with that. Yeah, no, I'm a firm believer that you have to go outside your comfort zone. Right. And, you know, you have to network. I know we all see, the three of us, we see and we get the value of using social media for networking. And I firmly believe that you, in order to leverage this, you have to go outside your comfort zone, which means you have to get off the computer. Yep. And you have to do what you and I did just a week ago, Chef, which is hop on the phone and have a conversation. Yep. And a practice that I put into motion every time I travel, and Tayo is my witness because we hung out earlier this year when I was in New York, is I will go in my social network, I'll go on LinkedIn and see who lives in New York. And if I'm visiting New York, I will make it a priority to reach out and actually meet up with people in person. Of because course. Well, I think social media is a great gateway to get you in front of certain individuals or to help you network and build your own spheres of influence. It's not the end all be all. You it's to- just a primer. It's exactly. just a primer. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So so as we look to wrap up the show, Chef, how do you feel that folks can get the best out of the opportunity of using social media? Well, it, it goes back to what we started with is what is your why? What is your real intention? You know what I mean? Because it's so obvious to all of us. Because the moment, meaning, meaning the viewers, meaning the viewer, you know what I mean? It's so obvious to me. I could tell you what someone's intention is by watching one minute of a YouTube video or one listening to one minute of a podcast. But, you know, I'm like older, you know what I mean? So I've heard, I've listened to a lot. I've been to a gazillion conferences you know, like this is the world that I'm fascinated with of of leaders who inspire, like real leaders who inspire. And so I just have a really fine tune, a really fine ear for being able to dissect someone's why. Like I could see it, I could feel it. And so if you focus on your why, if you really put the time to dissect who you are as a human being and then partner you know, find the right partner, meaning wife, spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, family members, friends, because that's all. I mean, we don't even have time to get into that, but you are who you hang with a hundred percent. And there are so many people who are never going to even have a shot as a successful, won't even be able to call themselves entrepreneurs because they don't have the right crew, the core crew, the people who push you, who challenge you, who support you. So that is first and foremost. So I would say find your why, and that's a process you have to do by yourself. Your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, not even your family members can help you with that. That's something that you have to dig deep and figure out, and that's something only you can do. And once you know what it is, and you're out there testing and doing the work, to really see if that's who you are and really see if that's what you like, then bring your crew in, get their opinion, get their support because you're going to need them. And and, I mean, listen, I've let go of a ton of friends. I have eliminated many people from my life, which was very, very difficult, really difficult. I'm talking about people that I loved, but the moment I realized that, you know, I'm just not getting what I'm giving and, I need a lot of support and I'm happy to support you on your journey. But when I see that you're not supporting me on mine, I got to go. Your contract is expired. You know what I mean? And you have to be that hardcore about it because this is your life we're talking about. You cannot have negative forces that are in your crew. You just cannot. It's not going to work. And so that's step number two. Once you bring in your crew, your core crew, and they – and you've selected them carefully, and now you're on a roll. Now it's just about spending the rest of your life 
getting better at that and willing to literally just take baby steps day after day after day. I mean, I'm 24 years. I feel like I'm just turning the page to a new chapter. You know what I mean? I have such a long way to go. But some might say that 24 years is already a lot. And I mean, I'm literally just getting started. So someone who is literally just getting started, like year one, you have to be patient. You have to put in the work. I mean, come on. In my mind, put in five, six, seven, eight, ten years, and then let's talk. You know what I mean? And most people of whatever generation, I'm not going to just say millennials, but most, the average person just doesn't have the wherewithal and the patience for that. No, I love it. And and um, as we wrap up here, you, we are just talking to Chef Lizette, the amazing Chef Lizette. What she's touched on is discover your why to do so, be introspective, and because only you know. Tap into that inner curiosity that you had when you were a kid, and then you discover what you have. Don't get bogged down by the idea of being realistic because only you can determine what's realistic for you. And also invest in relationships, whether it's it's through social media, but also through your your you know your outside life offline life because that determines you know who you are and how far you go you know you are the sum of the five people you hang around with and then put in the work hustle your way to the top and just hustle 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 overnight success usually take 10 15 years and don't be bogged down by any um any failure you have fail forward does that sound about right chef amen all right, amen. All right. That's it. where can That's we find it. you and how can people reach out to you I'm everywhere. <laughs> you could, I, I mean, my website is outdated and that's okay, but the <laughs> website does have all of my links. Um, it's really simple though. On Twitter and Instagram, it's Chef Lizette and then the number one. And everywhere else Snapchat, Facebook, Pinterest, Medium, uh, Beam, which is not even out yet. B-E-M-E. I mean, like every other platform is Chef Lizette. <laughs> F-C-H-E-F. And then Lizette, L-I-Z-E-T-T-E. All right. There you have it. Chef Lizette everywhere. And even on places that are not known yet. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure, gentlemen.